Well, for those of you who like to uh, look ahead and read ahead, next week we will begin a study of the book of John. Uh, John clearly states his purpose for writing that gospel in the, in the 20th chapter of John. He says, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So the gospel of John was written that we may know Jesus, truly know him and deepen our relationship with him. And it's going to be a great study as we dive in next week. Well, this morning is the second part of a two-part series on generosity. Last week I mentioned that we're at the uh, halfway point of our Next Steps Generosity Initiative. Last spring we called our church uh, family to a new vision, a new season of ministry, and to enable us to move forward in that new vision, we challenged every member of the body to join us in funding that vision. You remember we spent time, five weeks, looking into God's Word, looking at biblical principles of stewardship, and then challenging every member to be obedient and accountable to the level of generosity we see in Scripture. And our, our purpose in the Next Steps Generosity Initiative was not so much about amount of money, but it was to put us in a position to receive greater blessing from the Lord. It wasn't about a financial goal. It was about a goal of 100% of the body participating in the mission that God has for us. It wasn't about what we wanted from you as a people, but it was about what God wanted for you, what God wanted for us as his people. And our objective was to see 100% of our body obeying the biblical principles of giving and, and, and calling ourselves into deeper discipleship and a deeper walk with the Lord um, so that we could be in a position of greater trust and greater blessing. Many of you were ready last year, uh, about a year ago, uh, April, you took a step of faith. Some of those steps for many of you were certainly challenging, and there have been some great stories about how God has blessed the, uh, the steps of faith that you took. Some of you weren't quite ready yet, but that's okay. You weren't ready at that time to, uh, to take that step of faith and to, uh, to put that, uh, what God had called you to do on a card. But I just want to remind you, the Lord is always, if you're walking with Christ, he is always going to be stretching you. He will not leave you where you are. He's going to keep you growing in that walk of faith. And uh, he's not going to leave you um, at that point. So if you haven't taken a step of faith before, or if it's been a while, I'll, I'll be honest with you, it's, it's scary to take a big step of faith. And it's a little bit frightening to step out. You know, when I was in my early, uh, early 20s, I worked in a ministry and had a partner that I worked with, Billy, who was about four or five years older than me. Billy had been a, a world-class uh, competition water skier. And because of that, even though he wasn't competing anymore, he would do demonstrations. And Correct Craft every year would give him, or every other year would give him a brand new ski nautique. And so one afternoon, I was over at Billy's house looking at the, uh, the ski nautique, and I'd never seen one before. I grew up in South Florida, spent a lot of time on the water, a lot of time skiing, but I'd never seen a ski nautique. And this picture ski nautique had a big uh, post in the middle of the boat and a boom that extended out from it. Now, I, I didn't know what that was. I'd never seen that. And Billy explained, well, that's, that's for barefoot skiing. And, and we decided that I needed to learn how to barefoot ski. We decided. So a few days later, we're out on the Brazos River, and I'm going to give it a go. And Billy explains to me, what you're going to do is, is put your hands on that boom and keep your, keep your feet, legs out of the water, and walk yourself out to the end of the boom, and then keep your toes up and gently put your heels in and kind of sit back. Okay. So he in, engages, uh, he puts the boat in gear, and as he starts to accelerate, I've, I've got one leg already over the side of the boat. He says, wait a minute. You need to wait for my signal because we need to be doing about 35 to 40 before you get in. That's miles per hour. Now, I was still pretty young, unmarried, no kids. It's kind of adventurous, sometimes even reckless. But this kind of sounded like tempting death to me. So he gives me the signal, and I kind of maneuver hand over hand to the end of the boom, and then I just freeze. And I'm just hanging out there over the water. He's giving me the signal to go. The other guys in the boat are cheering. There's the problem right there. <laughs> but I couldn't get my body to respond. I, I just couldn't help but thinking what it would be like to hit the water at 40 miles an hour. So I'm praying, pretty sure I was praying, thanking Jesus that I had a home in heaven confessing every possible sin that had not yet been confessed. And my arms start trembling. I'm not going to be able to hold myself up. So finally, I put my feet in. 
and ski. And the thrill and the rush was incredible. Obviously, I survived. But the excitement of going that fast, I never wanted to use a water ski again. The speed, the excitement. I was so glad that I didn't chicken out on that experience. Now, let me pause here and say, if you're a family who spends time on the lake and you have a ski boat, please don't invite me to come out and, and demonstrate my barefoot skiing abilities. That was about 40 years ago. I'm not as reckless as I was back then. And I'll tell you when that changed, when my uh, preteen daughter, Sarah, I was leaving on a trip one time and she looked at me and a little tear trickled down her cheek and she said, Dad, please don't do anything stupid. Someone has to raise us. Now, I know that story is not about spiritual faith, but it really is a pretty good picture uh, of, of the life of a Christian, of a disciple as they walk with Christ. It, life is pretty good. It can be kind of quiet and, and very comfortable. And then you come to a moment where there's this huge challenge, this huge step of faith, a, a moment when your obedience to Christ is going to require something of you, a big step of faith. And you realize that moving forward means you're going to have to trust Christ in a way that you've never had to trust him before. And that's exactly how the Christian life is supposed to be, that we are taking big steps of faith. And, you know, when you do take a step of faith and when you do uh, get out of the boat, it is quite a thrill or quite a rush. And I know those aren't theological terms, but I don't know any other way to describe it to you. Some of you are on the precipice of taking a step of faith like you've never taken before. And anyone who's taken a step of faith can, can tell you it was a significant uh, mile marker, if you will, in their walk with Christ. They're able now to look back on that step of faith and see how much God has done and how much God has grown them in their walk of faith. And the Next Steps, initi the Next Steps initiative was all about us having a tangible opportunity to take a step of faith. As you came in this morning, you received a bulletin, and just like last week, there was a card in that bulletin, a Next Steps uh, commitment card. I want you to take that out just for a moment this morning. Many of you turned in a commitment last year when we began this Next Steps process. You turned in a two-year commitment, but I want to point out this card says one-year commitment card. Here's what we're asking. On March the 24th, we're asking everyone who is a part of this body, and by the way, I'm speaking to members today. I'll say again, as I said last week, if you're a guest here uh, this morning, we had 44 guests in the room last week. We probably have four here this morning after last week's message, but if you're a guest, we're not asking you to fund the ministries of this church. That is the privilege and responsibility of our members. But if, if you're a member of this church, if you did not make a commitment last year, perhaps you weren't even here yet last year, we're asking you to consider making a one-year commitment to our Next Steps initiative. And then secondly, if you were here last year and you made a commitment, we're asking you to reaffirm that commitment to let us know that you're going to be completing that commitment over this next year. And I'll just be real honest with you. If you made a commitment last year and you have really seen the Lord bless, we're going to ask you to consider praying and asking the Lord, is there something more that I need to do? And then on the 24th of March, we're asking everyone to be prepared to turn in their commitment card that morning in the service with those commitments they've made. And again, our goal is not a, a number. It's not a, a financial figure. Our goal is that every member of our body, everyone who's connected to the body would be a part of hearing from the Lord and participating in what he's calling us to do. And that's our goal with the Next Steps Initiative. All right, this morning we want to look at some New Testament instruction on giving. I want you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. While you're turning there, let me say a word about giving at Geyer Springs. I was in a conversation this week and someone said, you know, there are a lot of people in our church who probably wonder, where exactly does the money go that I give to this church? And we are uh, very open um, with our finances here, if you want to know more about our budgeting process, if you weren't here back in the fall when we went through that and handed out our budget, 
You can call the church, ask for the uh, executive pastor, Jason, or the director of finance, Tori, and they'd be glad to send you anything you would like to know. We go over all of our expenditures once a quarter. We have a committee that goes through that. We go through that in our business meeting. But I'm just trying to say to you, everything that we do is completely above board. There are no secrets here when it comes to finances. But, but let me just give you a quick overview. I can't give you all the details. Let me just give you a quick overview. When you give to Geyer Springs, what does your money go for? And here's a mental picture I want you to take with you this morning. Your money, when you give to Geyer Springs, funds everything from crayons to churches. You know, right now there's some children in worship care that are probably using crayons that you're giving bought as they color a picture to learn more about Jesus or a story in the Bible. Your money goes to give Bibles to every first grader. Every every first grader in our children's ministry receives a Bible from the church. In sixth grade, when they're moving out of children's ministry into student ministry, they receive a student Bible. Your money that you give helps fund all the opportunities we have for retreats and camps, for VBS, for children, for uh, teenagers. Your money helps buy discipleship materials and Bible study materials for all ages. But on the other end of that spectrum, I want you to understand this morning that your money not only funds things that we do here in ministry here, it funds a lot of community, community ministry, and ultimately it funds getting the gospel out, reaching new believers and planting churches. I want to show you this morning one really tangible example of that that perhaps you have not seen before. And I'm going to use figures from 2022 because 2023 they're still compiling. But when you give to Geyer Springs, you need to know that 20% of our giving to the church budget, 20% goes out to missions. We do a double tithe. The first 10% of that goes to our cooperative program. Now, if you're not a Southern Baptist, maybe you've never heard of cooperative programs. Southern Baptist churches are autonomous. We're self-governing, but we, as a group of churches, put our money together to fund mission endeavors. I wanna show you something incredibly exciting this morning that you gave to if you're a regular giver here at Geyer Springs. Just on the international mission front, 3,521 missionaries that we support around the world. That doesn't include any in the United States, that's just around the world. 3,521 missionaries completely supported by our giving. 67 new people groups engaged in one year. Now, when I say engage, you need to understand there are people groups that have never heard the gospel, had no engagement with the gospel, and in one year, as Southern Baptists, through our cooperative program, we engaged 67 new people groups, 728,589 people hearing the gospel, many of them for the very first time. And the response to that, 178,177 new believers in one year years time through our work at Southern Baptist around the world. 21,231 new churches are planted, 102,417 baptisms, 146,026 leaders trained. Now look at that. If you gave, you were a part of that. You were a part of all those who came to Christ. You're a part of 21,000 new churches in one year. If you gave, you were a part of that. Just think what we could do if every believer, not just in our church, but every Christ follower gave at least a tithe to what God wants to do. Before we jump into the text, look on the back of your bulletin. Let's do something kind of fun and and, uh, maybe a bit revealing. There's a little quiz on the back of your bulletin. And I know that you type A's and you people who struggle paying attention have already completed the quiz. But for those of you who haven't, let's do it now. I'll read it to give you time to answer the questions. And it's basically A, B, or C answers. And you can write either the letter A if your answer is the first, the letter B if your answer is the second, or the letter C if it's the third answer. All right, question number one. Which of these excites you most? A four-star vacation across Europe, if that's you, put an A. Making out, maxing out all your retirement accounts for the year, if that's you, put a B. Or knowing your sacrificial support helps successfully launch a new ministry. That's C. Okay, second question. You hear about a man who at age 70 has managed his middle-class income through meager living and careful savings and investments. He now has a current net worth of $8 million. Your first thought is, what a waste. Spending it would have been a lot more fun. Okay, be honest. Don't give me your Sunday school answers, okay? Be honest. B, wow, he really did well. I hope I can do that too. 
Or C, he may have missed some key opportunities to experience the joy of generosity. Question three, success looks like A, living comfortably, being able to travel, uh, enjoy travel and great entertainment, driving a luxury car, B, retiring at 50, or C, extending the payoff of your mortgage and forgoing some luxuries in order to sponsor a missionary family. Number four, your annual bonus is twice as much as you thought it would be. What's your first thought? A, I'm heading out for shopping or a vacation. B, I'm putting this on the mortgage. Or C, God has provided this so that I can be even more generous. For me, spending is A, effortless. I enjoy buying whatever I want. B, bothersome. I wish I could spend less. Or C, controlled. I feel good about the way I manage my spending. Question six, for me, saving is bothersome. It's an inconvenience that gets in the way of having fun. Effortless, I love building wealth, or it's purposeful. I have healthy and reasonable goals to which I'm carefully working. Beyond that, I plan to give the excess away. And then the last question, for me, giving is A, obligatory, B, formulaic, or C, joyfully generous. Now, this quiz is not necessarily uh, scientific, but it's pretty accurate. You say, well, well, pastor, what does it tell us? Well, if you look at your answers, if your answers were mostly A, you're a spender. If your answers were mostly B, you're a saver. If your answers were mostly C, then you're a steward. And I'm not going to ask you to share your answers. Uh, your spouse may have already peaked, and that may cause some conflict in your relationship. We do have marital counseling here available. I'm not asking you to share your answers, but... But your answers will tell you, help you understand your relationship with money. As you understand your relationship with money, it can help you move forward in biblical stewardship to have a balance between saving and, and spending and stewardship. I do want to give you one fun fact for you married couples um, that are here together this morning. I don't know if this is due to the humor of God or the providence of God, but it's almost always true that a saver marries a spender. Don't throw elbows. Think about it. A saver typically marries a spender, and you see the conflict that comes in marriage because of that. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9. Paul's giving extensive instruction on, uh, on generosity. This instruction is being given to the church. Uh, he tells the Corinthian believers, ultimately, look, you need to consider what Christ has done, what he's given up for you, and respond accordingly. Look in, in chapter 8 at, uh, what verse is that? Verse 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Look what he says. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. So he says, look, here's, here's the first principle you need to know. You need to look at what Christ has done for you. Look at how much Christ has sacrificed for you, leaving heaven, coming to earth, taking on a limited human body, Think about how much he's done for you. What he, he who was rich gave up became poor for you and respond accordingly. We're going to mainly be in chapter 9, verses 6 to 11 here. There are several principles here I want us to see this morning related to our stewardship and our generosity. 2 Corinthians 9, let's read verses 6 through 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 6. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he is decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever." He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. All right, so several principles here in this passage. Number one is there in verse six, you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. Sowing and, and reaping, the size of the harvest depends on the amount of grain that is sown. If you're a farmer, the size of your harvest next year is determined by what you do with the grain you harvest this year. See, when you bring in that harvest of grain, you can keep it all for your consumption. You can eat everything, use it all up, but then you have nothing left. Or you can make the decision when you harvest the grain to use what you need, but then set a portion aside 
so you can sow another crop next year and have a bountiful harvest. And Paul is simply trying to say to us here that when you sow spiritually, when you invest in the kingdom of God, when you don't keep it all for yourself, that produces for you in the years to come a bountiful harvest. God blesses us according to our giving. Now, let me be clear, I don't mean dollar for dollar. Uh, sometimes when you give financially, God returns the blessing financially, but sometimes those blessings are more in eternity, not just for the here and now. Last week in Matthew 6, we looked at Jesus' words when he said, store up for yourselves treasures where? Not on earth, but in heaven. But God indeed blesses us when we give. And you can talk to anyone who's been faithfully giving to God through the years, and they can tell you that they have seen his hand and they have seen his blessing on their lives. Second principle in verse 7 is this, God loves a cheerful giver. You see, the generosity of your heart is important as the size of your gift. And really, we ought to be pretty cheerful when we give, again, as Paul said in chapter 8, when we think about all that Christ has done for us. We ought to be pretty cheerful when we give, when we recognize that everything we have is from God. We, we didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. God blessed us, and he's going to continue to bless us. That should make us cheerful in our giving. In Psalm 50, God is, is uh, getting on to the Israelites. Um, they, by law, are supposed to make some certain sacrifices, and they're making the required sacrifices, but for them, it was just about keeping the letter of the law. Their heart was not in it. And so in Psalm 50, he basically says to them, hey, let's get this gift giving in perspective. What are, you, what are you giving me when you sacrifice an animal? Every animal belongs to me. Every creature that walks the earth is mine. You're giving me what I already own. And, and he says to them, because he's not happy with their heart, their perspective on giving, he says to them in verse 9, I will not accept a bull from your house. He doesn't want this ritualistic or this formulaic giving. He wants giving from a cheerful heart. Let me explain it this way. Let's suppose that, that you're an a eight or nine-year-old boy or girl, and, and everything you have comes from the allowance your father gives you. That's your only source of income, the allowance your father gives you. Well, Father's Day or your dad's birthday rolls around, and you come to him, and you, you extend a gift to him, and you say this. I really didn't want to buy this, but mom told me I had to. How's that going to work? And that's kind of what was happening here in Psalm 50. They really didn't want to make the sacrifice. Their, their heart wasn't in it. They weren't really grateful. They weren't being generous, and they're bringing these gifts to the Father. No, he says, I, I don't even want a bull from your house or a bull from your pen. Not when that's where your heart is. And so Paul is saying we need to think about what God has done for us, when we think about what he's done for us, why would we not be generous and have a generous or a, a thankful heart? Principle number three is, is all of verses eight through 11. He's just reminding us it's all from God. Whatever material blessing, whatever spiritual blessing you have, everything you do or everything you have is provided for and enabled by God. He talks about the grace that overflows in your life. That's from God. He talks about all the provision you have. That's from God. You know, it's interesting that studies show that as our society becomes more and more uh, affluent, people give less and less to charity. You know, one of the high points in the last hundred years, the high points of charitable giving was in the 1930s. In the 1930s, Americans gave more of their income to charity than at any other time in history. What was happening in the 1930s? The depression, the depression. And they gave 50% more of their income than we do today. And that corollary is certainly true in the church. You know that typically the better off we are, the less we think we can afford to give. Our church is heavily supported by people in the middle and lower income ranges. Oh, we, we have some big givers, and we're certainly thankful for that, but the majority of our gifts, the majority of our givers come from those middle and lower income ranges. And you know, honestly, from a worldly perspective, and, and I'll remind you, I don't know what any individual gives, but from a worldly perspective, we could look at some of our consistent, faithful givers and say, you know, they can't afford to give like that. But you know what they figured out? They figured out that spiritually, they can't afford not to give. And I'm talking about givers who don't just give a tithe, but they give generously even beyond the tithe. 
Can I remind you that we are made in the image of God? We should grow as, as disciples. We should grow to look more and more like our Father. And God is a giver. The world is here because God gives. You and I are here because God gives. We have the opportunity to have eternal life because God gives. He gave the life of his son so that we could have a relationship with him. I think our problem is we're afraid when we give, we're afraid we're going to lose something. We're afraid we won't have enough. Listen, I, I get it. Growing up as a young man in a single parent home with a mom on a school teacher's salary, and I watched her struggle to make sure she had enough to pay the mortgage and put food on the table and have a, a, a car to drive. I get it. There were many years of my life that I was afraid if I give too much, I'm not going to have enough. But the, the question came to me, is my God a God of abundance or a God of scarcity? He's a God of abundance. I'm not going to give too much and, and not have what I need. Look at verses 10 and 11 again. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. When we give generously, as God has instructed, we're not going to run out. What happens when we, give, when we give generously is he enables us to be even more generous because of our generous giving. I never imagined that I would be able to give as much to the church as I'm able to give today. And I don't miss any of what I give. And not only am I, and I'm not, I'm not bragging on myself here, I'm bragging on God, not only am I able to be generous to the church, I'm able to give away more money to people in need than I ever imagined I'd be able to give away. And the reason is, as I scatter seeds of generosity, God does what he says here in verse 10. He keeps multiplying the seed. And as God multiplies the seed, he reminds me that he's blessing me to be a blessing. God doesn't increase uh, the, the gifts to me to raise my standard of living, he increases what he gives me to raise my standard of giving. And it really is a thrill to be able to give generously. Well, let, let's cut to the chase and get to the bottom line this morning. Here's, here's what we want to know. How much should I give? I need to be careful asking that question. You don't need to be asking, well, what, what's the requirement? What do I have to give? What can I get? How little can I get by with? That, that's not the question. It's what has God called me to give? How much does God want to bless me? You know, in the Old Testament, it was pretty simple. You had the, the tithe, 10%. You don't see that in the New Testament. The tithe is a great place to start. What you see in the New Testament is generosity. It's not an amount, it, it's generosity. So let me just give you very quickly this morning as we wrap up three very simple principles that are throughout the New Testament that will help you determine what you should give. Principle number one, is God getting my first and my best? And you see that not just in the New Testament, but also in the Old Testament. You didn't sacrifice an animal that wasn't the first. You didn't sacrifice an animal that wasn't the best. You gave God your first and your best. So one of the principles we need to ask when we're thinking about our giving to the Lord is, is God getting my first and my best? Principle number two, I kind of touched on this last week. What does my money reveal about whom I love most, whom I trust most, and what kingdom I'm serving? If you could look at my checkbook or my credit card statement or my bank account, that should be able to tell you whom I love most, whom I trust most, and what kingdom I'm serving. It's a good indicator. Principle number three, do I recognize that all my resources belong to God? And if I recognize that, am I listening to the Holy Spirit on what to do with those resources? If my resources belong to him and I'm just a steward, then the direction on how to steward those resources, when to spend, when to save, when to be generous in my giving, that direction needs to come from the Holy Spirit. That's kind of where we left off last week. You need to listen to the Holy Spirit about your giving. Well, as we think about our response to Scripture this morning, 
I'm going to say the same thing I said last week. It comes down to a lordship issue. It's not a money issue. It's a lordship issue. You may be here this morning and your giving is right on target with where God would have it be, but maybe there's some other issue in your life related to lordship. Because it's all about our walk with Christ and our lordship, our submission to Christ as the master of our lives. I want to read one other section here from chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians. Paul is talking in chapter 8 about the, the Macedonians. They were very poor people, three basic churches that he refers to when he talks about the Macedonians. Very poor people because they were suffering for their faith. They were being persecuted. People didn't want to do business with them. They had no means of income. And so they're suffering, and specifically they're suffering financially. Well, the believers in Jerusalem are suffering as well. There are a lot of poor believers. And Paul has been, as he's on his missionary journeys, he's been taking up, receiving an offering for the poor believers in Jerusalem. He doesn't want to even ask the Macedonians to participate because they need help. But they wanted the privilege of being able to give. Listen to what he says in chapter 8, verse 1. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this not as we expected. Now listen to this phrase. But they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. You know what prompted the Macedonian giving? They gave themselves first to the Lord. It's all about lordship. If Christ is Lord, if you're listening to the spirit who indwells you as a believer, you're going to be generous as he directs you.